The Battle of Pharsalus was the decisive battle of Caesar's civil war. On 9 August 48 BC at Pharsalus in central Greece, Gaius Julius Caesar and his allies formed up opposite the army of the Republic under the command of Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus. Pompey had the backing of a majority of the senators, of whom many were optimates, and his army significantly outnumbered the veteran Caesarian legions. The two armies confronted each other over several months of uncertainty, Caesar being in a much weaker position than Pompey. The former found himself isolated in a hostile country with only 22,000 legionaries and short of provisions, while on the other side of the river he was faced by Pompey with an army about twice as large in number. Pompey wanted to delay, knowing the enemy would eventually surrender from hunger and exhaustion. Pressured by the senators present and by his officers, he reluctantly engaged in battle and suffered an overwhelming defeat, ultimately fleeing the camp and his men, disguised as an ordinary citizen. However, Pompey was later assassinated in Ptolemaic Egypt by orders of Ptolemy XIII. Chapter 1, Prelude A dispute between Caesar and the Optimates faction with many of Rome's aristocrats and well-to-do patricians in the Senate of Rome, culminated in Caesar marching his army on Rome and forcing Pompey, accompanied by much of the Roman Senate, to flee in 49 BC from Italy to Greece where he could better conscript an army to face his former ally. Caesar, lacking a fleet to immediately give chase, solidified his control over the western Mediterranean, Spain specifically, before assembling ships to follow Pompey. Marcus Calpurnius Bibulus, whom Pompey had appointed to command his 600-ship fleet, set up a massive blockade to prevent Caesar from crossing to Greece and to prevent any aid to Italy. Caesar, defying convention, chose to cross the Adriatic during the winter, with only half his fleet at a time. Caesar was now in a precarious position, holding a beachhead at Epirus with only half his army, no ability to supply his troops by sea, and limited local support, as the Greek cities were mostly loyal to Pompey. Caesar's only choice was to fortify his position, forage what supplies he could, and wait on his remaining army to attempt another crossing. Pompey by now had a massive international army, however, his troops were mostly untested raw recruits, while Caesar's troops were hardened veterans. Realizing Caesar's difficulty in keeping his troops supplied, Pompey decided to simply mirror Caesar's forces and let hunger do the fighting for him. Caesar began to despair and used every channel he could think of to pursue peace with Pompey. When this was rebuffed he made an attempt to cross back to Italy to collect his missing troops, but was turned back by a storm. Finally, Mark Antony rallied the remaining forces in Italy, fought through the blockade and made the crossing, reinforcing Caesar's forces in both men and spirit. Now at full strength, Caesar felt confident to take the fight to Pompey. Pompey was camped in a strong position just south of Dyrrhachium with the sea to his back and surrounded by hills, making a direct assault impossible. Caesar ordered a wall to be built around Pompey's position in order to cut off water and pasture land for his horses. Pompey built a parallel wall and in between a kind of no man's land was created, with fighting comparable to the trench warfare of World War I. Ultimately the standoff was broken when a traitor in Caesar's army informed Pompey of a weakness in Caesar's wall. Pompey immediately exploited this information and forced Caesar's army into a full retreat, but ordered his army not to pursue, fearing Caesar's reputation for setting elaborate traps. This caused Caesar to remark, today the victory had been the enemies, had there been any one among them to gain it. Pompey continued his strategy of mirroring Caesar's forces and avoiding any direct engagements. After trapping Caesar in Thessaly, the prominent senators in Pompey's camp began to argue loudly for a more decisive victory. Although Pompey was strongly against it, he wanted to surround and starve Caesar's army instead, he eventually gave in and accepted battle from Caesar on a field near Pharsalus. Excerpt from Cassius Dio's Roman history gives a more ancient flavor of his take on the prelude to the Battle of Pharsalus, as a result of these circumstances and of the very cause and purpose of the war a most notable struggle took place. For the city of Rome and its entire empire, even then great and mighty, lay before them as the prize, since it was clear to all that it would be the slave of him who then conquered. 
when they reflected on this fact and furthermore thought of their former deeds they were wrought up to the highest pitch of excitement, they now, led by their insatiable lust of power, hastened to break, tear, and rend asunder. Because of them Rome was being compelled to fight both in her own defence and against herself, so that even if victorious she would be vanquished. Chapter 2 Date the date of the actual decisive battle is given as 9th of August 48 BC according to the Republican calendar. According to the proleptic Julian calendar however, the date was either the 29th of June or possibly the 7th of June. Chapter 3, Location The location of the battlefield was for a long time the subject of controversy among scholars. Caesar himself, in his commentary Ida Bello Civili, mentions few place names, and although the battle is called after Pharsalos by modern authors, for ancient writers, the author of the Bellum Alexandrinum, Frontinus Eutropius, and Erosius, place it specifically at Pelephasilus. Strabo in his Geographica mentions both old and new Pharsaloi, and notes that the Thetiden, the temple to Thetis south of Scotusa, was near both. In 198 BC, in the Second Macedonian War, Philip V of Macedon sacked Palifarsalos, but left New Farsalos untouched. These two details perhaps imply that the two cities were not close neighbours. Many scholars, therefore, unsure of the site of Palifarsalos, followed Appian, and located the Battle of 48 BC south of the Enipeus or close to Farsalos. Among the scholars arguing for the south side are Biquignon, Bruer, and Guatkin. An increasing number of scholars, however, have argued for a location on the north side of the river. These include Perrin, Holmes, Lucas, Rumbo, Pelling, Morgan, and Shepard. John D. Morgan in his definitive Palifarsalus, The Battle and the Town, shows that Palifarsalus cannot have been at Palaiacastro, as Biquinion thought, nor the hill of Fartid's army within the walls of Pharsalus itself, as Cromea and Gwotkin thought, and Morgan argues that it is probably also not the hill of Curi, some seven miles northwest of Pharsalus on the south bank of the Enipeus, as Lucas and Holmes thought, although that remains a possibility. However, Morgan believes it is most likely to have been the hill just east of the village of Crini very close to the ancient highway from Larissa to Pharsalus. This site is some six miles north of Pharsalus, and three miles north of the river Enipeus, and not only has remains dating back to Neolithic times but also signs of habitation in the 1st century BC and later. The identification seems to be confirmed by the location of a place misspelled Porfari or Falapari shown on a medieval route map of the road just north of Pharsalus. Morgan places Pompey's camp a mile to the west of Crini, just north of the village of Avra, and Caesar's camp some four miles to the east-southeast of Pompey's. According to this reconstruction, therefore, the battle took place not between Pharsalus and the river, as Appian wrote, but between Old Pharsalus and the river. An interesting side note on Palifarsalus is that it was sometimes identified in ancient sources with Thyre, the home of Achilles. Near Old and New Pharsalus was a Thetiden, or temple dedicated to Thetis, the mother of Achilles. However, Thyre, the kingdom of Achilles and his father Peleus, is more usually identified with the lower valley of the Spurcios River, much further south. Chapter 4, Name of the Battle Although it is often called the Battle of Pharsalus by modern historians, this name was rarely used in the ancient sources. Caesar merely calls it the Proelium in Thessalia, Marcus Tullius Cicero and Hirtius call it the Pharsalicum Proelium or Pugna Pharsalia, and similar expressions are also used in other authors. But Hirtius also refers to the battle as having taken place at Palifarsalus, and this name also occurs in Strabo, Frontinus Eutropius, and Erosius. Lucan in his poem about the civil war regularly uses the name Pharsalia, and this term is also used by the epitomizer of Livy and by Tacitus. The only ancient sources to refer to the battle as being at Pharsalus are a certain calendar known as the Fastium Etonini and the Greek authors Plutarch, Appian, and Polyanus. It has therefore been argued by some scholars that Pharsalia would be a more accurate name for the battle than Pharsalus. Chapter 5 Opposing Armies 
The total number of soldiers on each side is unknown because ancient accounts of the battle focused primarily on giving the numbers of Italian legionaries only, regarding allied non-citizen contingents as inferior and inconsequential. According to Caesar, his own army included 22,000 Roman legionaries distributed throughout 80 cohorts, alongside 1,000 Gallic and Germanic cavalry. All of Caesar's legions were under strength, some only had about a thousand men at the time of Pharsalus, due partly to losses at Dyrrhachium and partly to Caesar's wish to rapidly advance with a picked body as opposed to a ponderous movement with a large army. Another source adds that he had recruited Greek light infantry from Dolopia, Acanania and Aetolia, these numbered no more than a few thousand. Caesar, Appian and Plutarch give Pompey an army of 45,000 Roman infantry. Osorius describes Pompey as having 88 cohorts of Roman infantry, which at full strength would come to 44,000 men, while Brunt and Wiley estimated Pompey's Roman infantry as being as 38,000 men, and Greenhalgh said they contained a maximum of 36,000. It was in his auxiliary troops and in particular his cavalry, all of which vastly outnumbered Caesar's own, that Pompey derived his greatest advantage. He seems to have had at his disposal anywhere between 5,000 and 7,000 cavalry, and thousands of archers, slingers and light infantrymen in general. These all formed a remarkably diverse group, including Gallic and Germanic horsemen alongside all polyglot peoples of the East, Phoenicians, Cretan slingers and other Greeks, Jews, Arabs, Anatolians, Armenians, and others. To this heterogeneous force Pompey added horsemen conscripted from his own slaves. Many of the foreigners were serving under their own rulers, for more than a dozen despots and petty kings under Roman influence in the east were Pompey's personal clients and some elected to attend in person, or send proxies. Chapter 5 Section 1, Caesarian Legions Caesar had the following legions with him the Vi Legion veterans of his Gallic Wars. The Seventh Legion veterans of his Gallic Wars. The Eighth Legion veterans of his Gallic Wars. The Ninth Legion veterans of his Gallic Wars. The Ex Legion veterans of his Gallic Wars. The Eleventh Legion veterans of his Gallic Wars. The Twelfth Legion veterans of his Gallic Wars. The 13th Legion Veterans of His Gallic Wars. The 27th Legion, a legion constituted in the summer of 49 BC the bulk of Caesar's army at Pharsalus was made up of his veterans from the Gallic Wars, very experienced, battle-hardened troops who were absolutely devoted to their commander. Chapter 6, Deployment On the Pharsalian Plain, Pompey deployed his army with its right flank against the river. Each cohort of Roman infantry was formed in a much thicker formation than usual, ten men deep, in order to prevent the men in the front line from fleeing and enable his troops to absorb the shock of Caesar's attack. With this in mind, they were to tie down Caesar's infantry and thus give time for the superior Pompeian cavalry to overwhelm the enemy's own and subsequently attack Caesar's flank and rear. As a precaution, 500 to 600 Pontic horsemen and some Cappadocian light infantry were placed on the right flank, but, trusting that the river would provide sufficient protection to this wing, Pompey concentrated the bulk of the cavalry, his key to victory, in the left flank. Pompey's legions were arrayed in the traditional three-line formation, four cohorts in the front line and three in the second and third lines each. He stationed in the center and wings the troops in which he placed most confidence, on the left stood the two legions which Caesar had given to the Senate shortly before the civil war began, while the two legions brought from Syria by Scipio were placed in the middle, and on the right the legion from Cilicia together with the cohorts brought from Spain, the space between these experienced soldiers was filled with raw recruits. Pompey also dispersed 2,000 re-enlisted veterans from his previous campaigns throughout the entire army in order to strengthen its ranks. The infantry column was divided under command of three subordinates, with L. Lentulus in charge of Pompey's left, Scipio in the center and L. Domitius Ahenobarbus on the right. Pompey himself took up a position behind the left wing in order to oversee the course of the battle, while the cavalry on that wing was placed under command of Titus Labienus, 
a former lieutenant of Caesar. Caesar also deployed his men in three lines, but, being outnumbered, had to thin his ranks to a depth of only six men, in order to match the frontage presented by Pompey. His left flank, resting on the Enipeus River, consisted of his battle-worn 9th Legion supplemented by the 8th Legion, these were commanded by Mark Antony. The Vi, 12, 11 and 13 formed the centre and were commanded by Domitius, then came the 7th and upon his right he placed his favoured 10th Legion, giving Sulla command of this flank, Caesar himself took his stand on the right, across from Pompey. Upon seeing the disposition of Pompey's army Caesar grew discomforted, and further thinned his third line in order to form a fourth line on his right, this to counter the onslaught of the enemy cavalry, which he knew his numerically inferior cavalry could not withstand. He gave this new line detailed instructions for the role they would play, hinting that upon them would rest the fortunes of the day, and gave strict orders to his third line not to charge until specifically ordered. Chapter 7 battle. There was significant distance between the two armies, according to Caesar. Pompey ordered his men not to charge, but to wait until Caesar's legions came into close quarters, Pompey's adviser Gaius Triorius believed, that Caesar's infantry would be fatigued and fall into disorder if they were forced, to cover twice the expected distance of a battle march. Also, stationary troops were expected to be able to defend better against peeler throws. Seeing that Pompey's army was not advancing, Caesar's infantry under Mark Antony and Gnaeus Domitius Calvinus started the advance. As Caesar's men neared throwing distance, without orders, they stopped to rest and regroup before continuing the charge, Pompey's right and center line held as the two armies collided. As Pompey's infantry fought, Labienus ordered the Pompeian cavalry on his left flank to attack Caesar's cavalry, as expected they successfully pushed back Caesar's cavalry. Caesar then revealed his hidden fourth line of infantry and surprised Pompey's cavalry charge, Caesar's men were ordered to leap up and use their peeler to thrust at Pompey's cavalry instead of throwing them. Pompey's cavalry panicked and suffered hundreds of casualties, as Caesar's cavalry came about and charged after them. After failing to reform, the rest of Pompey's cavalry retreated to the hills, leaving the left wing of his legions exposed to the hidden troops as Caesar's cavalry wheeled around their flank. Caesar then ordered in his third line, containing his most battle-hardened veterans, to attack. This broke Pompey's left-wing troops, who fled the battlefield. After routing Pompey's cavalry, Caesar threw in his last line of reserves a move which at this point meant that the battle was more or less decided. Pompey lost the will to fight as he watched both cavalry and legions under his command break formation and flee from battle, and he retreated to his camp, leaving the rest of his troops at the center and right flank to their own devices. He ordered the garrison auxiliaries to defend the camp as he gathered his family, loaded up gold, and threw off his general's cloak to make a quick escape. As the rest of Pompey's army were left confused, Caesar urged his men to end the day by routing the rest of Pompey's troops and capturing the Pompeian camp. They complied with his wishes, after finishing off the remains of Pompey's men, they furiously attacked the camp walls. The Thracians and the other auxiliaries who were left in the Pompeian camp, in total seven cohorts, defended bravely, but were not able to fend off the assault. Caesar had won his greatest victory, claiming to have only lost about 200 soldiers and 30 centurions. In his history of the war, Caesar would praise his own men's discipline and experience, and remembered each of his centurions by name. He also questioned Pompey's decision not to charge. Chapter 8 Aftermath Pompey fled from Pharsalus to Egypt, where he was assassinated on the order of Ptolemy XIII. Ptolemy XIII sent Pompey's head to Caesar in an effort to win his favor, but instead secured him as a furious enemy. Ptolemy, advised by his regent, the eunuch Quatinus, and his rhetoric tutor Theodotus of Chios, had failed to take into account that Caesar was granting amnesty to a great number of those of the senatorial faction in their defeat. Even men who had been bitter enemies were allowed not only to return to Rome but to assume their previous positions in Roman society. Pompey's assassination had deprived Caesar of his ultimate public relations moment, pardoning his most ardent rival. 
The Battle of Pharsalus ended the wars of the First Triumvirate. The Roman Civil War, however, was not ended. Pompey's two sons, Gnaeus Pompeius and Sextus Pompey, and the Pompeian faction, led now by Metellus Scipio and Cato, survived and fought for their cause in the name of Pompey the Great. Caesar spent the next few years mopping up remnants of the senatorial faction. After seemingly vanquishing all his enemies and bringing peace to Rome, he was assassinated in 44 BC by friends, in a conspiracy organized by Marcus Unius Brutus and Gaius Cassius Longinus. Chapter 9, Importance Paul K. Davis wrote that Caesar's victory took him to the pinnacle of power, effectively ending the Republic. The battle itself did not end the civil war, but it was decisive and gave Caesar a much-needed boost in legitimacy. Until then much of the Roman world outside Italy supported Pompey and his allies due to the extensive list of clients he held in all corners of the Republic. After Pompey's defeat former allies began to align themselves with Caesar as some came to believe the gods favored him, while for others it was simple self-preservation. The ancients took great stock in success as a sign of favoritism by the gods. This is especially true of success in the face of almost certain defeat, as Caesar experienced at Pharsalus. This allowed Caesar to parlay this single victory into a huge network of willing clients to better secure his hold over power and force the Optimates into near exile in search for allies to continue the fight against Caesar. Chapter 10, In Popular Culture the battle gives its name to the following artistic, geographical, and business concerns. Pharsalia, a poem by Lucan. Pharsalia, New York, U.S. Pharsalia Technologies Incorporated. In Alexander Dumas The Three Musketeers, the author makes reference to Caesar's purported order that his men try to cut the faces of their opponents, their vanity supposedly being of more value to them than their lives. In Mankiewicz's 1963 film Cleopatra, the immediate aftermath of Pharsalus is used as an opening scene to set the action in motion. Chapter 10 Section 1, Ancient Sources Chapter 10 Section 2, Modern Sources Brunt, P.A. Italian Manpower 225 BC to AD 14. Oxford, Clarendon Press. ISBN 0198142838. Dealbrook, Hans. History of the Art of War Volume 1, Warfare in Antiquity. Translated by Walter J. Renfro, Jr. Lincoln, University of Nebraska Press. ISBN 0-8032-6584-0. Goldsworthy, Adrian. Caesar, The Life of a Colossus. London, Weidenfeld and Nicholson. ISBN 0-297-84625. Greenhalch, Peter. Pompey, the Republican Prince. London, Weidenfeld and Nicholson. ISBN 0-297-77881-1. Morgan, John D. Palifarsalus, The Battle and the Town. American Journal of Archaeology. 87, 23 54. DUI, 102307504663. Schta 504663. Shepherd, Simon. Pharsalus 48 BC, Caesar and Pompey, Clash of the Titans. Oxford, Osprey Publishing. ISBN 184603-0021. Archived from the original on the 22nd of February 2020. Wiley, Graham. The Road to Pharsalus. Le Thomas. 51, 557-565. ISSN 00238856. Shta 41,541,372.